This is the Story Punks podcast, a show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. I'm your host, Cindy Grigg. This is episode 24. I'm here with Gail Carriger. I know. <laughs> Just let that soak in. She's amazing. And this is happening. And I'm so excited. I have admired Gail Carriger for a very long time. She's a steampunk author, a podcaster, and many other things. And before I jump into this, let me just say for anyone who is watching the YouTube version of this podcast, you will not see us talking back and forth because this is an audio only episode. And so if you are looking for video of Gail, head on over to gailcarriger.com and check out her blog because she does Facebook live events and all kinds of good things, including recently she did this really cool tour of her office and it does include a reading nook. So I'm just saying you will be totally inspired. Check it out. And the other thing I want to mention right off the bat is that this episode is sponsored by Audible. If you have not jumped into one of Gail Carriger's audiobooks, I suggest you make that one of your summer reading picks. I keep a running list, as you probably well know by now, and that's at storypunks.world forward slash audible. And that's where I recommend punk related titles where I just feel like the story and the narrator work together. And that is absolutely true in the case of Gail Carriger's work. She has this knack for, for finding these narrators who just do an amazing job at doing the impossible, bringing out an, another dimension to what is already a really cool story. So and again, find my recommendations at storypunks.world forward slash audible. And let me just give you a quick update of everything I've been working on. The deco punk time travel thriller work in progress that I've been trying to polish up and to get out the door, despite some hiccups that I have, you know, been sharing in my personal updates. Yes, it is ready. So this is kind of my last call. And if you are interested in beta reading this work, I would absolutely love that. So again, it's called The Salt Sheen Paradox. Book one is called Hives of the Halcyon. And my character, Moxie, time travels from the 1920s to points beyond and time periods beyond. And she does so through a network of time travel portals on the Earth's salt flats. So it's a really cool adventure. It has lots of cool flavor because it's definitely anchored in her time period. She keeps returning to her own time period and then she is working to fight conspiracies in other time periods. So um, yes, join my list of beta readers. Thank you to everyone who has already joined. And you'll also notice if you go to my site, cindygrig.com, which is where you sign up for this, you'll notice there is another series coming and that is Peacock Levine and the Ethereum Fates of Knot. And that is a time, uh, I was going to say a time travel thriller. No, that is a steampunk Regency era adventure. And it has to do with Norse mythology. I would absolutely love to get your feedback. So again, you can sign up for both of these at cindygrigg.com. C-I-N-D-Y-G-R-I-G-G.com. Okay, so without further ado, I'm so thrilled to be starting this interview. Now I say that because this is going to be a two-part series. That's just because we cover so much content. So in part one, we talk about Gail's work, but she's also going to talk about her influences, and this gets really fascinating. That's all I'll say. Okay, so then at the end of this episode, I'm actually going to do a little intermission where I share... Gail's response to a personal question I asked her at the end of the real-time interview when we recorded. It's just super, super fun, and I think you're really going to enjoy that. I know I did. <laughs> and then part two of this interview will be episode 25, so next week's episode, and we will be talking marketing and how Gail has been able to get so many things done. I mean, she is, she's written more than 20 books and she has more than, you know, a dozen New York times bestsellers alone. So she is killing it. And basically she has some really cool insights that I think creators of all stripes can benefit from. So 
Uh, without further ado, let's get right into this interview. Again, I am so grateful for Gail Carriger's time because she's very, very busy and you are in for an absolute treat. Here is part one of my interview with the wonderful and the innovative Gail Carriger. Hi, Cindy. How are you? Oh, my goodness. This is a surreal experience hearing your voice on my line. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Gail Carriger writes comedies of manners mixed with paranormal romance in the sexy San Andreas Shifter series as G.L. Carriger. Her books include The Parasol Protectorate, Custard Protocol, and Supernatural Society series for adults, and the Finishing School series for young adults. She has published in many languages and has over a dozen New York Times bestsellers. She was once an archaeologist and is fond of shoes, octopuses, and tea. So an absolutely fascinating bio, right? And let me just say, though many listeners already know, Gail Carriger only gets more interesting from here. So um, if you follow her, if you read her work and so on, it's just only going to get more fascinating. So Gail, welcome onto the show. I'm so delighted. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Okay, so in this show, we discuss the punks. And today, of course, we're focusing on steampunk. So what is your definition of the term? It's just nice to hear what everybody feels is inbounds or out of bounds and why. And optionally, if you want to share your thoughts on other punks as well, that would be fantastic. All right. So I guess my definition of steampunk would be um, it's retro futurism or it is the future as the Victorians imagined it from a sort of I guess that is sort of the, the fast term that I would give at a cocktail party. Um, it has other connotations depending on whether you're into the aesthetic steampunk movement, which is more recent or into the original literary movement that comes out of cyberpunk. And so for People who would want to ask me or talk about the literary side, I would say it comes from the idea of cyberpunk, which is punk in terms of a um, uh, a subversive movement against the status quo, whatever move that takes. And then um, the steam has to do with the prevalence of a, of a steam-based technology as opposed to an electronic technology. So... Yeah. And then if you want to talk about the aesthetics, my favorite is uh, steampunk is basically the love child of Hot Topic in a BBC costume drama. <laughs> okay, that is a new one for me, Gail. That is fantastic. <laughs> Both of them, actually, but but especially that last one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's my favorite, actually. Awesome. I come, I came to steampunk from the aesthetic movement, so I'm really driven a lot as a writer by the whimsical nature of the craft of steampunk. Um, you know, like things like teapots coming out of top hats and that sort of stuff. It just makes me really happy. So yeah, the lighter yeah. side. And um, I think anyone who has read Gail's work would agree. And I know we have lots of listeners, as I've mentioned, who are already well versed in Gail's work. <laughs> so as I ask this next question, uh, I know many people already understand your series, but could you give us a brief synopsis of each series just for anyone who's brand new, and also maybe a specific memory for those of us that that know your series well. <laughs> All right. Um, so my, for, I'm going to do it in chronological order because it's just easier on my brain. Um, th they, most of my books are in the same universe or loosely associated with one another, um, but it's now gotten quite sort of a sweeping universe. I don't, I, I'm, I'm up to over 20 books at this juncture, so it's hard to keep track of. Um, yeah. so my first series is called the parasol protectorate and it starts with soulless and that's probably the book I'm, I'm most known for. And that series is definitely comedies of manners, basically. Although, um, I'm a huge fan of Victorian Gothic romances. And so each book is also a parody of a different Gothic trope. Um, like for example, the second book is sort of, um, a fall of the house of usher kind of crumbling serious gothic only of course it's me so it's me poking fun at that <laughs> um and the, the 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 third book is an adventure a victorian adventure story that kind of would eventually become um, westerns uh in the literary movements so so that's the parasol protectorate series i guess what would be my my favorite memory of that one is the first time i saw my book on the shelf which of course is the first time I saw any book ever on the shelf that had been written by me. <laughs> and it was back in the days of Borders. And I had, uh, I had one of those bubble tea drinks, those, those Vietnamese 
tea drink things <laughs> and two of my girlfriends with me and uh, we were like well, maybe the book is here in the store let's go see so we go like wandering in and then there it is on the shelf and we just start squealing and, and we're like, making verbally noises with our bubble tea drinks and one of the one of the clerks kind of comes over and is like uh hi and we're like that's my book that's my book <laughs> she's like would would you like to sign the book? I was like, oh, yes. Can I? So she, yeah. well, can I? Yeah. So she goes to the back and she brings all the books and I'm signing them all. And then we're walking out and my girlfriend turns to me and she's like, how did I know you're really you? They never asked you for I- identity or anything. Oh, like, and I was totally. like, oh, because there's a crime spree accostination of people going in and <laughs> signing books that aren't theirs. Yes. Know? This is a big problem. <laughs> big problem. <laughs> I was expecting you to say like the the bubble tea went everywhere or something. So yeah, I we were controlled with our bubble tea, but it was a clear <laughs> thing. It was pretty exciting. That's awesome. I did when I got when I got called by New York about that book with with the with the, an offer. I di- I was drinking a latte at the time. Yes, I also drink coffee, and uh, <laughs> and I did sputter foam like <laughs> over the whole table. I was like. <gasps> <laughs> So that was my first series. And then uh, I come from a young adult backtra- background and I'm really passionate about young adult uh, fiction in general. Um, I st- it's still a lot of what I read. And so uh, I was approached to write a YA series and I set it in the same universe, although chronologically it's a sequel. And that's called the Finishing School series. Um, that kind of comes from my love of old British boarding school, like the Little Princess book, for example. Oh, yeah. Um, so... And I always was fascinated by the idea of finishing schools where young ladies went to sort of be trained in manners. And I essentially took that and twisted it and decided I would write a finishing school where young ladies were trained to use manners ruthlessly in subversive activities. So they're all trained as spies and assassins. So, and of course it's me. So that finishing school takes place in this sort of massive convoluted dirigible that floats aimlessly above Dartmoor. And my, my main character is recruited, um, accidentally or, or sort of sideways. She does. She thinks she's being sent to a regular finishing school. It turns out it's this, this school for spies. So. so good. Yeah. So that's that one. Um, and my sort of favorite memory associated with that was meeting one of my younger fans for the very first time. And she was with her parents. I think she was like eight. I mean, really young. The, the, the jacket says nine to 12 for the finishing school books, but, um, but, you know, they've been read by all different ages. I was a real advanced reader myself. So yeah, I know a lot of kids like yeah. to read up like that. Yes. yes. Um, anyway, so this this young lady must have been like seven or eight. And uh, she was so excited. She was literally just bouncing up and down when she got to meet me. <laughs> it was the cutest thing I had ever seen. And she still, to this day, proudly carries the moniker of my bounciest fan. <laughs> just call her just the bounciest fan. That's pretty um, cool. Well, you've done an amazing job, not to interrupt you, sorry, but uh, you've done an amazing job of balancing your different audiences. That's been really fun to see as someone who's writing. Yep. It is really hard to do um, because... Because after, so I did the Parasol Protector, then the Finishing School, which is why, and I did the Custer Protocol, which is a spinoff of the Parasol Protector. It's like the next generation, but it's kind of more capers. I wanted to write something kind of more like Steampunk Leverage mm-hmm. or, you know, or, 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 or Firefly or something, sort of like a, a more group-oriented um, succeed together kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that's the Custer Protocol stuff. But then after that, I started doing spinoff series that are much more kind of adult and, and romantic. Um I have a I have a queer series that's lesbian, gay, and transsexual romances. That's called the Supernatural Society. Again, all set in the same universe. Um, but it was a sort of gentle thing to be like, okay, you know, the delightfully deadly books are sort of spinoffs from the finishing school books. It's all the characters, side characters from that series, who are now grown up and actually are spies and assassins, and kind of what they're getting up to. But they're also kind of romantic, and and there's all sorts of other stuff going on. So I have to warn new readers of the finishing school books that they can't or maybe should be cautious about transitioning directly into the Delightfully Deadly series. Fortunately, the original readers of the Finishing School series are now all grown up. So that works. <laughs> but... Um, so it has been it has been interesting, like figuring out how to categorize them, and the you know like I put quite a bit sexier covers, for example, on the delightfully deadly series because 
I just want people to kind of know what they're getting into and not be too surprised. And and so far, everybody's been pretty good about it. Yeah, so awesome. So on your website, you describe your work in terms of Jane Austen dabbling in science and steam technology. Yeah. And when I read this, it didn't surprise me outright because I immediately felt the congruence. And yet your series are set later in the century. So please tell us more about Austen's influence on or relevance to your stories. So one of the first essays I ever wrote was... Um for that that was like a seriously meaningful for public consumption so to speak was my AP exam essay uh, at the end of high school for um and it, and I chose to write it on Austin's use of humor to subvert social standards and I've always admired that in her as an author is that she can be extremely funny she's she's not she, she's not often credited for that um but she does have an, sort of element of it. It's not. It's not. It's very subtle humor. It's not like slapstick or anything. Um, although sometimes I think with someone like Mr. Collins, it could be getting into slapstick. But, yeah. Um, and so I've always kind of admired that. That the humor is an incredibly powerful weapon for social commentary, um, and it's very, very subversive because people don't really realize. I kind of want to go to. People, for example, my my books are hugely popular in places like Texas, especially the young adult series. And there's a part of me that wants to kind of go and be like, I know it has a pink cover and a girl in a poof <laughs> dress, but you do kind of realize what your girls are reading. No, okay, okay, well, Seriously. let them read that. <laughs> go for yeah. it. Read the book by all by all means. It's totally innocuous. No, not threatening <laughs> at all. Um, and I really like that. I love kind of the power and humor. I've I've admired that in Austin as well, and so that that's part of it. Um, I've always I just grew up with Austin. I think she's more part of the zeitgeist than someone like Gaskell, who I sort of came to later. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I will say that I um, I think there's a lot of similarities in the general historical romanceness of. Um, Regencies and Victorians. I think the setting is sort of irrelevant to a lot of those particular tropes that many of which spawn out of Austin. Um, but I prefer the dresses of the Victorian era. I don't like Regency clothing at all. It doesn't suit my figure. So I don't like to wear it. Um, they really just look like nightgowns to me. That's what I was going to say. You don't like nightgowns? No. <laughs> um, so I was always, I specifically set all of my books in time periods where the clothing is also quite ridiculous. So I chose what I feel like are some of the most ridic- ridiculous time periods, which is the 1870s, which is the first first major bustle era so these huge yeah. ridiculous bustles and, and often sort of clashing colors um and then my second series is set in the 1850s because of the big poofy skirts with mo- multiple horsehair petticoats although i will admit that the crinolines are even more ridiculous but <laughs> um but uh yeah timing reasons and then the the custard protocol series is set during the 1890s because of those ridiculous puffy sleeves which of course um <laughs> Come in handy. Yeah. yeah. Very <laughs> important and absurd. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, I, I do tend to pick my, my settings based on um, how outrageous the clothing is. <laughs> OK, I love that it's fashion driven. And for anyone who hasn't gone to Gail's blog, which is Retro Rack, she gets into tons of fashion, but also on your main site, right? Gail Carazzo.com. Yeah. Most of the most of the fashion stuff is confined to Retro Rack, but occasionally I'll like do a little thing where I talk about specifically the fashion as relates to the book or a character, and then it'll be on my main blog. But like I just did the parasol. So there, my first character's main weapon is a kind of steampunked parasol gadget. It's like the Swiss army knife of parasols. (laughs) Um, And I, I just wanted her to have something that she would carry that was a weapon that was ubiquitous to the time period and the parasol seemed like the perfect thing. Um, But that parasol kind of gets passed on to future generations and there are new iterations all the time. And so I did a post recently where I talked about the research behind that and what styles I chose and why and what what it looked like in my head. I don't know if it comes across the page that way. but Oh, totally. It was an awesome post. I loved the one with the jewel, the like emerald jewel handle of the parasol from your collection oh oh my parasol so yeah that's so that's what i did is i did the post about the characters parasols on my regular blog and then i did a post about my parasol collection on my retro rack blog so oh okay that's where i was <laughs> so 
I, as soon as I started to write about parasols, people started to gift me with parasols, which is not a bad thing. But uh, I do sometimes wonder if I shouldn't have written about, say, Jaguars or BMWs a little bit more. <laughs> um, and I did name the custard protocol book the custard protocol book because custard is my favorite dessert. <laughs> I was hoping to encourage people to bring me custard, although... It's not exactly an easy dessert to bring to author signings, but it is yeah, my favorite. Just whip out this custard. Well, that's genius right there. <laughs> well, on the on the Jane Austen point, I I often refer to you as a satirist. Would you call yourself that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a satirist. There's nothing safe. I'm like, I'm just going to poke fun at that for a while. Uh, I get very, the, I only really get distressed when somebody takes me seriously. <laughs> That makes sense. <laughs> I think so. Okay, so I noticed you taught a class a few months back that I just would have loved to have gone to, but alas, I couldn't. But it touched on understanding and using historical Gothic literature's tropes and in romance, including yes. steampunk. Yeah. So I wondered how this intersects with your unusually inclusive cast of characters in terms of race, gender, other considerations. So basically, in what ways do Gothic tropes mesh with diversity or empower mm. writers in that way? Well, it's hard because, again, I, I always go with a subversive tactic. So one of the reasons, I mean, it fit organically into the ideas behind my universe. So, it, okay, let me start at the beginning. As a very short <laughs> answer, what happened was I, I'm, I'm a scientist by training, so I was conceptualizing the way um, science would work in the Victorian era if supernatural creatures were injected into that era. And the best thing that I could come up with is that technology would evolve differently to cope with the presence of immortals or a presence of the supernatural, both in terms of like medical science, trying to dissect and understand immortality, but also in terms of um, uh conveyances and staying away from essentially the presence of an apex predator amongst humans and or several apex predators in my case. And so uh, I, so the injection of a supernatural element into my books had steampunk consequences, but it also allowed it me to be very much more playful and diverse because I created these essentially liminal characters that are outside of society, but also weirdly controlling society because they are so powerful. So mm -hmm. vampires in, in my universe kind of control and dominate fashion and um, espionage and all, and they're, you know, major landowners and they're very good at invest, investing, but they're also really good at sort of harvesting information. They're very interested in, in manipulation of the prey species um, because they are grossly outnumbered. Um, and then, uh, and so you, I end up, this allows me to then create and dabble with characters that um, did exist in the Victorian era, but were liminalized in a completely different way. They were, you know, marginalized. Whereas I can take these sort of immortal characters, and, and for example, I have a really popular, extremely gay vampire, and uh, he's sort of totally accepted, um, oddly in the way that, say, Oscar Wilde was early on before his trial, um, in that in in that way that society will accept. The, the extremely arrogant, uh, arrogant, sorry, the extremely aberrant if they are artists mm. or performers or whatever, aberrant in the eyes of society, mind you. Um, you know, the, the, the British, for example, have always had a very interesting relationship with cross-dressing um, in all of its many and varied forms, and they definitely did during the Victorian era. Um, absolutely delighted and fascinated with cross-dressing, both men dressing as women and women dressing as men. So I wanted to take that and give that marginalized element of society power. And the fun way for me to do that, and I felt the best way given my the parameters of my universe, was to make the immortals very much patrons and involved in the arts. Um, and so that allows me, this is a very long way of me saying that this allows me to really, really play with and mock the worst parts or some of the worst parts of Victorian society. Um, not all of it, because I don't want to be depressing. Always keep it light and fun. That's kind of my motto, you know, but it does allow me to make social commentary. And I'm not really pissing anybody off because the character that's making that social commentary is like a vampire or a werewolf or something, right? So yeah. they're not quote unquote real. Therefore, they can um, act in extreme ways that allow me to poke fun at things, uh, oh, including yeah. us and them. <laughs> 
This might be verging off topic. If it is, I'll cut it. But have you been watching the Frankenstein Chronicles? No, I have not. For some reason, this is hitting a nerve with that. I've been watching it recently. And it is really interesting what they can do with Frankenstein's monster. Yes. Because he is it's supernatural. It's not exactly. It's very, I mean, I'm also to, to sort of bring it back to your original question about the gothics. I'm one of the very interesting things about super early gothic literature. And I'm talking well before the Victorian era, uh, books like the monk, for example, mm. is those, those books are exploring uh, the contentious relationship between humanity and the devil as supernatural. So the evils of um, that the church imagines. But what you see with the rise of the Romantic Gothics during the Victorian era is the um, zeitgeist beginning to struggle with not the evil as religion imagines it, but the evil that we create ourselves, the um, sort of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or um, or Frankenstein, literally the monsters we make with technology. And that, of course, has to do with this rise of industrialism that's going on during the Victorian era. And so you see the literary movement um, kind of pivoting to reflect that, what's going on around them, which is this uh, technology that that we fear, but of course might also be our ultimate savior. And that is naturally what is going on right now in our own culture. It's a different kind of technology, but I think we're definitely dealing with this same struggle, like the technology that is uh, terrifying us and may be our downfall also might be our savior. And it's a very interesting struggle, especially if you write something like steampunk, which as far as I'm concerned, should by its very definition be dealing with this struggle because of the, the punk aspect of steampunk, the sort of subversive nature of the movement. And so that, that that's just always really fascinated me as a steampunk writer is I, f I feel like it almost... Um, it's almost this neat, tidy, beautiful little circle. If as a writer, what I do is explore um, the tropes that are developed in the Victorian era while I'm writing about this alternate Victorian era now, <laughs> you know, it's very meta. Um, it's one of the reasons I've, I've dove so hardcore um, into romance as well is because the more I was reading about the rise of the early romance writers, which also come out of the Gothic movement, like Anne Radcliffe, for example, um, is how vilified they were at the time and how um, dismissed and and cr criticized oh, by completely. Yeah. so badly by, of course, male critics. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, this is the time period where we see the rise of the middle class and we see women have more leisure time and we see women becoming adults and having been educated. And so we see a rise of female readers and what they are often reading are these books. And so these books then become very dangerous subconsciously to the male critics who are vilifying these books because women are enjoying them and reading them and buying them because they have disposable income. And the technology is rising to produce books cheaper as well. So it allows these books to be criticized as literal trash, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you, but yeah. it, it, and that, of course, you know, I, I, one of my favorite things to say is if you don't like the romance genre and if you're harshly critical of it, then you're simply, you know, participating in 200 years worth of misogyny. So, like, so I, so I kind of went down this path of exploration. I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm going to, like, own it and start writing a couple of romance novels as well. You know, I've done everything else. I might as well keep going. <laughs> and, of course, I'm still, like, poking fun at all of the tropes and, and parodying things and stuff. But what I'm parodying is early romance novels from the Victorian era. Um, that so, is so yeah. fascinating. <laughs> yes. It's so much fun. I love, I mean, I wouldn't write steampunk if I didn't love history, but of course in writing it, I end up loving the history of the very genre that I'm writing, which is, is I mean, all of everything I love about, as a reader comes out of the early Gothic movement or the late Gothic movement from the Victorian era. Like all of my favorite genres romance, science fiction, and fantasy, um, adventure, mysteries, they all come from that. Any, all of what we now you know, dismissively refer to as the commercial genre fiction, um, that all comes out of this moment in time. And that's for the Western zeitgeist, at least. And that's really exciting to me. It's completely exciting. And for <laughs> so I have several listeners or watchers who ask me about themes, they want to know more about themes. And that was just 
an, an amazing dose of themes surrounding steampunk, surrounding gothic literature, and everything that came out of that literature, which is, frankly, what a lot of our punk genres came out of if you go far enough back. Yes. So thank you. Yes. Yeah. And it's it's fun to um, dive a little into the, the history of the gothics if you're interested in sort of getting those early themes. That presentation that you were talking about that, that I originally put together was basically me being like, OK, everybody, if you write sci fi, you know, there's a a reason that, um, and I forget the, the technical term for it, but this this idea that you will see in a movie like Aliens, which is sort of a horror, is another one, of course, that comes out of the gothic movement naturally. Oh, but yeah. if you get something like hey, Aliens, which beautifully is combining both horror and sci-fi, um, this idea of sort of the claustrophobia and how um, the atmosphere of that movie and the visuals and the music are all elements that add to mood and are, are integral to the mood, in fact. That is a gothic thing. Like, you would literally have something like the House of Usher, which is crumbling and rotten because the house itself is representing the emotions of the and the um, condition of, of moral condition of the owner of that house. This idea that um, that the atmosphere outside that you have a gray day with rain when when inside somebody is crying is very much some or, or, or is miserable is the, the tie of those things is very much something that comes out of um, of, of gothics and so as a writer or a creator or whatever it is you're doing with something like steampunk you can just take that and in my case just play with it you know so I will have it be pouring rain outside and like everybody's inside having a fabulous tea party and something <laughs> explodes you know like I will yeah. play with, with with jarring my readers with those kinds of con contrasts because jarring is a is a is a way to terrify but it is also a way to make people laugh yeah yeah, absolutely. And it's like, it's the symbolism or the themes, I guess there's different words we may have heard of this kind of thing by in the past, but yeah, that was a, I, yeah. the, the uh, when I'm doing the lesson, I tend to use archetypes and tropes as the two words, um, archetypes being character related tropes being sort of thematic, um, story related concepts. But um, yeah, there's a lot of verbiage to use for this, <laughs> but it is it is really fun to learn about because, of course, then you can you can either follow it or you can break it and you can manipulate and play with everyone's expectations, watchers, readers, um, viewers, whoever, whoever it is, you can the audience, you can play with their expectations and um, that is what we do, I think, as creators is we want to manipulate the human experience. Oh, totally. Thank you so much. You know, one thing I've wanted to do is to go back through Austin's works and read what her characters were reading and what, frankly, they were <laughs> mocked for reading. Oh, <laughs> like in yeah. Northanger Abbey. Northanger Abbey in particular. I think yeah. I want to say she's reading Radcliffe or something. Is it Mysteries of yeah. Udolpho or I don't you, know. Oh, is, it is it Udolpho? That I don't know if sense. I'm saying it right. <laughs> there, I mean, if you go back and then try to reread them, I mean, reread what they're reading, like Udolpho or She Stoops to Conquer or something, yeah. they're really hard. <laughs> they're okay. Pretty, they're, <laughs> the early gothics are a real challenge to read um, because they're such purple prose and there's so many things that are done there that feel sort of clump, clunky. It's uh -huh. a little bit like trying to watch an early sci-fi movie. Like, yeah. like, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, good, you're good like, analogy. Oh, yeah, oh, this is work, um, <laughs> but of course, to them it was it was outrageous and fabulous. But um, yeah, it, it is fun. I, I, yeah, Northanger Abbey is particularly great because the the beauty of Northanger Abbey, which admittedly is is for Austin pretty clunky um, because it is an early work, but um, it is Austin parroting the romantics that were popular at the time. And so like, it's a parody yeah. and then like people go and parody Northanger Abbey and you're just like, Whoa, <laughs> parody within a parody within parody. Yeah. Um, I love that. Okay. Listeners, watchers, are you just like, Whoa, <laughs> there's just so much here. And I know that there's a lot to absorb, but before we end this episode, I want to share one last question that I asked Gail Carriger. Now, this was a personal question I asked her. I'm going to use it as a kind of intermission between the two episodes. So we still have, I don't know, about five or ten minutes left of this episode. But it will be listening to her response when I asked her about tips and tricks for my upcoming travel to Bolivia and Peru. And this is 
a really good example of what you can expect when you check out her podcast, which is called 20 Minute Delay. She hosts this with Piper J. Drake, and they have so many interesting stories and just really awesome ways to save money or to bring the right gadgets for certain situations you may be facing that just make travel not as fun as it could be. And it's so worth it. So I can absolutely recommend it. Go check out that show 20 minute delay. And here we go. Well, one last question. So I'm traveling in a little bit to, I think a site where you used to uh, do you, some of your archaeology. So Peru. No, really? Are you going to Peru? Yeah. So do you have <gasps> any just traveler tips? Oh, my God. It's been a long time since I've been there. I it figured, is. Are you yeah. going to Cusco and Machu Picchu? Or? Yeah. And I'm going to, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but Arequipa and like Puno. So I'm basically, I'm going to Bolivia, but then I was like, uh, how do I not I'm go to Peru? Jealous. You know? I've never been to Bolivia and I'm so jealous. Yeah, I um, hope it's good. <laughs> You're leaving yourself a little extra time to acclimatize to the altitude. That's yes. that's good. I mean, that's okay. like common knowledge. For me, have you been to high, high altitude before? No, like I live in Utah, so we're halfway there, but not yeah. quite. <laughs> so for me, I don't know if this would work for you, but for me, the best thing was actually just to take a little low impact walk. Okay. Like, uh, it just kind of got my lungs going and got me inhaling a bit more on- oxygen and stuff. Um, but I always did. I always got the headache the first day, but it, you know, it passed for me. I slept on it and it would be gone the next day. Oh, that's good. Um, but cause I would fly directly into Cusco. So there was no acclimatization. <laughs> I'd just it be like there, there. 10,000 10, or whatever it was. Um, and then into the field. Um, yeah, I mean, I love Cusco. It's a great city. The next book that comes out, my July release, the competence, they go to Peru. I saw um, that on the cover. Yeah, I was like, yeah, a few people were like, is that Peru? So it's Cusco square on the cover of the American one. And it's Soyan Tatambo on the cover of, um, Oh, it is. Yeah. I'm hiking to Chokikiro, but it's basically because there weren't any more passes to the Inca Trail. Well, if you have any time at all in the Cusco area and you can get out of the town, Piquiacta is near Cusco. um, And it is a site that is just like tragically under viewed. It's not a ritual site. It's a housing site, but it's an entire city and it's not Inca. It's Wari, the earlier Mm -hmm. culture. Um, and it's it's just like you can it's a little bit like the for me it's like the version of Her- Herculaneum or Pompeii because you can literally walk down the streets of of an actual city as a like I'm I've, I've always been a household archaeologist by preference um, so I've never been big on sort of temple and ritual stuff but um, I think Pikiakta is fantastic it's it's a drive south of Cusco down the valley. So you also will see a bunch of ruins like Hacienda, like colonial ruins and stuff. And you will pass my old site, which is Chocopuquio, which is not open oh, to the okay. public. Um, but it is a, it is a Hacienda ruin and then a temple ruin above it. And, um, and then you'll get to Piquiacta. And Piquiacta is open to the public. At least it was when I was there. There's a big, um, visitor like parking area and stuff. And you just walk on through it's, and it's, it's just really fun to, and, and the cool thing to think about when you're in Pekiakta is that um, the roadways were probably mostly covered over and also kind of would be the lower levels of built. So you would like walk under people's houses and stuff. And the way it's constructed, you would, of course, the upper levels aren't there anymore, but you would you would open out onto these assembly areas which were kind of whitewashed stone and so you would be in darkness and then open up into this sort of oh, wow. white open space it's a it's a totally fascinating city so uh, it, it's i don't know how easy or hard it is to get there because i always just went with the archaeology peeps the and, <laughs> yeah yeah um but it, it's it, sometimes I know sometimes the tourist bureau would run runs visits out there. So you can it's at least worth asking about. Yes. Thank you. I've jotted it down. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, yeah. So that's my biggest tip. And then, of course, I I don't know how uh, experimental you are uh, as an eater, but uh Guinea pig tastes exactly how you think it is, which is basically halfway between pork and rabbit. Rabbit, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I would recommend the roasted, like the oven roasted version of it where it's like whole and it comes out looking like a dead critter, which is kind of creepy, but that's right. the best taste. Really? Um, 
I think, but my favorite um, meat in existence happens to be alpaca. So I really? would recommend if you get a chance to eat alpaca steak in particular, it's, it's like, it's basically the Kobe beef of the pork world. It's, really good. Um, so I don't, I don't like, I don't know what your dietary things are. And then there's some great vegetarian, like the papavarinas and stuff, which are the potatoes that are stuffed with yummy vegetables and spaces and things. Yeah. Um, Did and you get favorite- sick off the vegetables? You know, I've heard warnings yeah. about fruits and vegetables. Yeah. So the rule is don't eat a vegetable that can't be peeled. So yeah. I, but because I would be there for for two or three months, and so I would come back and be like, I have to have spinach. I just like eat spinach <laughs> for three days because you can't eat leafy greens, basically. Um, but I never did get sick. So, I, but I was only there, you know, three years in succession. So, um, I mean, my my field soup got sick at one point. Like, it's always a risk. I love um, fruit juice. Yeah. And you can get fresh squeezed fruit juice, like strawberry juice and stuff all the time. And in the higher end hotels, they tend to be, or, or restaurants, they tend to be a bit better. But, you know, we were archaeologists, so we just eat everywhere. Yeah. And <laughs> I fortunately never got sick, but it was definitely fortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say, like I always say on the travel podcast, travel with activated charcoal, um, if you can. You have to get some. It's, it's real cheap and easy to find. And it's just like, if you feel your stomach start to just be like, blah, 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 mm-hmm. just like pop one of those and it might, it might help. The problem with the non-potable water in Peru is that it's uh, the, 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 the evil is a, an amoeba and there's no, um, preventative tactic you can take against an amoeba. It's just going to like get into you and come out any way it possibly can. And you're just going to be miserable for three or four days. Yeah. Um, so it's bad if you get it. Um, so, you know, the risk is kind of yours to, I would be there for right. so long that I like, I cannot survive another day without strawberry juice, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just can't. Yeah. Um, and then the other piece of advice I would give you, cause I'm so food oriented is, um, the like cakes and things are not very good because okay. it's really hard to get a good rise in altitude. Oh yeah. So one of the things you'll notice in Peru is like cheesecake is really popular for an example, for example, because it's, but they do have a, um, uh, food that is customarily in like the bars and taverns and stuff, which is pancakes, which are, are kind of like um, a crumpet meets a pancake or a crepe. Oh, and that sounds good. They're just like a love. They're like a lovely little dessert, like have it with beer kind of food, and they usually serve it with like a drizzle of condensed milk or or something in there. Okay. They're, they're, pancakes are del- they're one of my the things I miss. <laughs> yeah. What about spice level? It's really bland in the highlands, at least. So in the lowlands in, in Lima, it's very much influenced by Spanish cuisine. So it's like um, fish and and very, but not spicy. The, More, it's the, yeah. the Peruvian food is not spicy at all. Like I went there after having lived in Mexico for a while, and I was like, oh, and I love spicy food. <laughs> yeah, me um, too. Yeah. So like I actually developed a taste for it in the highlands because you end up really appreciating the um, the ingredients themselves so like the trucho which is the fish you can get which is a freshwater trout um like it's just lovely and sweet and delicious and you'll get like a little you know cilantro sauce on it or something like that um and then they do uh frites they so they do um french fries and roasted chicken is kind of like one of their street foods that you'll get all the time they, these big sort of pizza oven type things but they use them for roasting chicken so that's always a good like quick food you can get like a piece of chicken or a quarter of a chicken and a little mound of fries that's kind of like their fish and chips in yeah, Peru. actually sounds um, good i i it's i mean it's kind of weirdly turned into a comfort food of mine so i sort of miss it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah it's mostly uh, meat so it's mostly cow meat and tr- and trout those are like the two things they have and then lots of potatoes yeah and uh, and the, there's a, another street food called chocolate con queso, which is um, a super salty kind of feta cheese with a, a wedge of chocolate corn, which is corn kernels that are, they're huge. Each each corn kernel is like, you know, oh, like a puff. Yeah. I yeah. think yeah. I've seen and stuff so, like that. Starchy, juicy corn with this really salty <laughs> cheese, and they have them together. And it, oh, it's That's just, pretty it's good. good. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, and, and don't eat hamburgers. Okay. Um, they're weird and gross and just strange. Just stay away. <laughs> stay away from hamburger. It's it's like they like take ground meat and like mix it up with deli ham or something. It's very oh, strange. strange. It's really weird. So okay, <laughs> there okay. it is. I'll stay but away from that. I, you'll, you'll have a great 
time. It's it's amazing. It's, Thank you. It's a beautiful, beautiful yeah. part of the world. And it sounds like you're, you know, frankly, hiking, hiking the Inca Trail is not all that exciting. So is it? Okay. If you're seeing, if they're seeing some of the sites that like aren't the normal big sites, then you'll have a great time because they're they like if you can get out to Pekiakte, it'll be you and like maybe ten other people. It's, it's, yeah, it's an amazing site. So I, I highly recommend it if you can get to it. If you're interested in, in household archaeology. Uh, thank you so much. And thank yeah. You. Thanks for an awesome interview and have a wonderful trip. Oh thank my goodness. You. I will. And I'll keep listening to your uh, podcast for good tips. Because oh, I'm not, as, I, I I'm not as much of a traveler, but I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to, to hang. So yeah, well, we try to give tips that'll help everybody. <laughs> yeah. It's like perfect for someone like me. Thank you so much. Yeah. Of course. Pretty nice, right? <laughs> to get personalized travel advice from Gail Carriger, I'm still nerding out and really can't believe that that happened. <laughs> so uh, go to your podcast aggregator of choice and search for 20 Minute Delay, wonderful, informative hosts, Gail Carriger and Piper J. Drake, and they will teach you all their ways. Once again, we will be continuing our conversation next and in that episode, we'll be talking about tools of the trade and marketing. And then we'll also be touching on, you know, fiction and stuff. But just so you know where that discussion is going, if you would like to beta read what I was researching when I was in Bolivia, just head to cindygrig.com, C-I-N-D-Y-G-R-I-G-G.com. I would absolutely love to have you on my beta reading team. It's a way to read for free. And other than that, I just wish you well with everything you're working on. More Gail Carriger in two weeks.